son of suns. Time giver, all powerful. Your beauty only eclipsed by your holy power. An energy so great that I pray of day when man make it here on earth. And if that day come, all worries will melt in your fiery inferno. Pray tell, will this day ever come? Hi, I'm Dom and welcome to the very first episode of Everything. And if it wasn't clear from the intro today, I'm going to be talking about nuclear fusion. The process that has kept the sun blazing for 4.5 billion years and will keep it going for an estimated 4 billion more. So how does it work? Well, the basic idea is that when you fuse two elements together, you get a heavier element and a release of energy. So for example, fuse two hydrogen atoms and you get the next heavier element up, helium. The easiest fusion reaction to do is between two isotopes of hydrogen or two kinds of hydrogen deuterium aka heavy hydrogen and tritium super heavy hydrogen the nuclei of each isotope are charged push them together and they repel sort of like when you take two magnets and push the same poles together but if you can get two nuclei close enough something called the strong force starts to act and pull them together when this happens fusion takes place and lots of energy is released. Energy that can be used to produce electricity. But if we can already get energy from splitting atoms, why would we want to bother with fusion? For starters, fusion offers up many more times the energy per kilo than in nuclear fission reaction. Not only that, but there is no long-lived radioactive waste, so no mess for your great, 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 great grandchildren. There's no risk of meltdowns, no CO2 pumped into the atmosphere, and the fuel supply is virtually limitless. So what's the catch? Well, as I'm sure you're aware, stars are pretty hot. Scientists need to heat up hydrogen atoms to around 150 million degrees Celsius. They then need to maintain that temperature for fusion reactions to continue. So for over 50 years now, scientists have been working on the technology to do this, primarily using two techniques. The first uses lasers. Lasers like those at the National Ignition Facility or NIF in California. In the facility, 192 beams from one of the world's most powerful lasers are arranged in a circle, all focused on a single tiny target, a minuscule 10 milligram pellet containing deuterium tritium gas. This pellet, costing almost a million dollars, is then blasted by ultra amplified laser beams, which at their peak provide 500 trillion watts of power to the target. That's about 125,000 billion of these all in just one short laser pulse lasting only a few nanoseconds. And a fun fact, fun fact, a nanosecond is only one billionth of a second or about what a second is to 31 years. The intense heat produces x-rays which are focused on the pellet creating an implosion that shrinks the gas inside to 1 35th of its size like shrinking a basketball to the size of a pea. Under these extreme pressures, fusion takes place and enormous amounts of energy are released. But the lasers are still using far more power to create their energetic pulses than is actually in the laser beam itself. So overall, more energy is put in than is got out. It's a far cry from what is known as ignition. Ignition is the point at which fusion becomes self-sustaining and no external energy is needed to keep it going, only more fuel. It's like burning a pile of wood. Once you've lit it, you don't want to have to keep using matches to relight it. You only want to add more wood to keep it going. The other contender for fusion systems is what's called magnetic confinement. ITER, or the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, falls into this category. This colossal reactor is currently being constructed in southern France on a site the size of 60 football pitches. Once built, the reactor will weigh an incredible 23,000 tons. That's over a hundred Statue of Liberties. Add that to the rest of the reactor complex and you're now up to 400,000 tons, more than the weight of the Empire State Building. ITER is designed to heat up a cloud of hydrogen gas to a whopping 150 million degrees Celsius in its donut-shaped container called a tokamak. Under these temperatures, 
the hydrogen turns into plasma, which is basically the fourth state of matter, a very hot, thin, fragile state about a million times less dense than air. The sun is essentially one giant ball of it. And in fact, plasma is the most abundant form of ordinary matter in the universe. Keeping it in place though is very difficult. To do this, ITER will guide the plasma along magnetic lines using massive superconducting magnets cooled to minus 239 degrees Celsius. Almost sounds easy. Well, no. Chief Executive of the UK Atomic Energy Authority, Stephen Cowley, has compared it to trying to hold a lump of jelly in place with knitting wool. Unfortunately, the whole project has been delayed, meaning ITER won't be up and running until 2027 at the earliest. But do not despair. Introducing the Wendelstein 7X. It might sound like a cheap German beer, but it's actually a fusion reactor or a stellarator. Similar in many ways to ITER, this stunning and quite frankly sexy piece of kit is due to be switched on at the end of the month in Griswold, Germany. It's mind-bogglingly complicated to design was created with the aid of a supercomputer to work out the best magnet configuration for optimal control of the plasma. But like ITER, Wendelstein is an experimental fusion reactor, not a functioning power plant. For those, we'll have to wait. But if they are successful, then we could be close to witnessing a revolution in energy production, paving the way to clean, cheap and plentiful power for all. Fingers crossed, or should I say fused. Well, that's it for my Maiden episode. If you liked it, or if I dare say you learned something, then please subscribe. And if you've got any ideas for any future videos, put them in the comments below. My name's Dom, and you've been watching everything.